I know my usual viewers are wanting some Disgaea themed content and this isn't it. But it is a strategy RPG and it's become one of my personal favourites. Videos are hard to start so I'm just going to jump straight into it. Banner Saga is really flipping good. You can probably tell by the fact it's won a whole bunch of awards that something special is going on. I've recently binged all three games for the first time. And this is going to be a review for all three games because as its name implies, the series is a complete story with a beginning and an end. While the different games do try different mechanics and features in each one, the driving force is always the story, and it never sways too far from its core gameplay either. Decision making and turn based strategy battles, all centered around a very character driven narrative. There's going to be a few minor spoilers about a couple of characters in this review, but I'm going to try and keep it to a minimum. If you've seen any of my videos from my Star Games series, and um, you probably haven't, you'll realize that I only tend to pick games for it that I find both interesting and that I enjoyed for being unique in some way. Banner Saga is not without its flaws, but it is a game that made me feel something without it trying to become a movie. Some games are made by people who just want to be making films. These cre- I nearly call them creatures. <laughs> These creators have a deep-rooted embarrassment to be working within a medium that's relatively young and has this varied appeal. Because let's face it, games are a mess. They can be a toy, a sport, or an art, and different people want those different aspects from them. Banner Saga is story-driven, and it's well-written enough to lend itself to becoming a film or animated series but it flourishes as a video game. Although, you know, I wouldn't say no to an animated series, I'll be honest. You spend a good deal of Banner Saga in a zoomed out perspective, watching your caravan move from one place to another. Believe it or not, this can be used for both shots of tranquil beauty, as well as some of the tensest moments in the game. On this traveling screen, time slowly marches on as you also march towards your destination. When the timer ticks over, another day has started, and your group expends some food and usually loses a little morale. Fail to keep up your food, and morale starts dropping as well as people in your caravan as they start starving to death. Fail to keep up your morale, and you lose precious willpower in battle, but more on that later. Along the way you run into seemingly random events, but these events aren't actually random. The carefully crafted decisions you have to make as the leader of a group, a group of often unruly and difficult people. These choices aren't just for show, they affect your team, your caravan and often the whole story. I think one of the most valuable aspects of the game comes with these moments. You'll probably be able to make it to the end of the game even if you screw up and make a lot of bad choices. But the people you grow to care about within the world will suffer, and even die for it. It makes your decisions feel like they have weight, while still preventing a traditional game over in most cases. The other advantage to the zoomed out perspective is spectacle. Now with many modern reviews, I think spectacle can become a bit of a dirty word. But I'm not talking about spectacle for its own sake. Seeing the vast landscapes and architecture in this Viking inspired world both gives a sense of tone and awe, as well as reminding you of your own group's size and frailty against that tremendous backdrop. There are moments sprinkled throughout that take this to the extreme by panning over to something you just don't expect to see coming, or something so vast and unworldly that you do begin to fear for your Viking crew. I'm not going to spoil these moments. But I do want to give a good example. There's one time when you begin to approach your destination, you start to see smoke coming into view along the edge of the screen. And as the camera pans over, you notice that the refuge you've been traveling towards for so long is actually a smoldering wasteland. It's punctuated by some well-timed and well-directed voice acting, and it hits you hard. You become invested in this world and these characters, and while I haven't talked much about the story yet, it's how the story is woven together through choices made along this camera perspective that puts it into focus, both the plight of single characters 
as well as the needs of the entire exodus. I want to give special mention to a small detail to how the timer stops for the most part during moments of voice acting or when approaching or traveling through an important new location. It lets you concentrate on what's happening in front of you, take in the frankly breathtaking artwork and it also gives you a much needed respite from the tension of possibly running out of supplies. In general, the other half of the gameplay is the turn-based strategic battles. As you travel, you come across characters that are a bit of a step above your usual army in terms of combat prowess and also story importance. These are your hero characters, and they can be brought into battle as the frontline team that you control. Each of these characters belongs to one of many different classes, and has their own passive and active abilities, some of which are unique only to them. The combat itself is in one way a very traditional strategy battle system. You know, you move your characters to a new position, you choose an attack, and then the opponent gets to do the same. But there's a few interesting differences I want to mention that both makes it unique and, to me at least, very addicting. First of all is the turn order. A character from your party will take their turn, and then a character from the enemy's team. You'll be cycling through each of your own characters on your turns, and the enemy will cycle through each of their characters on theirs. You may not have noticed why this is such an interesting decision, but it's actually extremely important for the way the combat works. Because your opponent will always get the same number of turns no matter how many of them you kill, the goal becomes not to quickly finish off enemies one at a time, but to make a number of weak and useless enemies so that they can't hit hard with their decent ones. Then, once they're all weak, you go about quickly finishing them all off one by one. Luckily, there is a bit of a safeguard when a team only has one unit left. The other team in this scenario goes into pillage mode, which means they can use all of their team members in a row before the other team gets to use their last character once. This is to prevent the end of battles from dragging on too long, and it also stops the losing team from having an unfair comeback if their last unit happens to be a bit of a badass. The other big difference in Banner Saga's combat is its health and its stat system. And this ties in very closely to the turn system actually. Characters have three main numbers you need to be concerned about in combat. Strength, armor, and will. Strength is both a unit's health and also their attack value. So the more you get hit, the less you're gonna hit for. This is why you should quickly bring down the strength of your opponents and leave them weak instead of killing them they can become useless and waste your enemy's turns. Armor is your defense value. If your strength is lower than your opponent's armor when you're attacking, you're going to do at most one damage, and you might do none. Armor is subtracted from a foe's strength during the attack. So hit someone while you have 10 strength, and they have 7 armor, and you're only going to do 3 damage. The really clever thing about this is, it's a decision you have to make every turn. Will you attack the opponent's strength value or their armor value? You need to attack armor to make them soft enough to do big damage. But the temptation is always there to quickly bring down their health so they can't hit you back as hard. It adds a huge layer to the decision making, as well as to the setup of your characters. Some of your team will have better armor breaking stat, and better abilities for breaking armor than others. And some classes excel at keeping their armor up and soaking up the damage, while others are sneaky and they have utility abilities to bypass armor or make enemies lose turns. There's a lot to manage, but luckily the complexity ramps up very slowly over the three games. And if you load your save data between each game, you're keeping your teams and your setup throughout the entire saga. Finally, there's willpower. This stat is like MP from other RPGs. You spend it to use your abilities. But it can also be used in a couple of other ways. You can use it to move further and deal extra damage for each extra point you spend. These exerted willpower attacks also ignore armor, so you could potentially do 4 damage to a tough enemy that would normally only take 1. Knowing when and how to use each character's will is as crucial a decision as knowing when to attack armor and when to attack strength. But if you want a quick tip from me, just spend it. 
use as much as you can because you get it back after each fight anyway. As mentioned earlier, good morale will also give each of your team more will at the start of battle, which is invaluable. The consequences of falling in battle are, bizarrely, not quite as severe as making bad story decisions. While losing a battle in its entirety can have a big overall impact on your journey, individual heroes being defeated actually just injures them. You can't die in battle. I think this is both something of a concession to the complicated nature of how the story branches between so many different possible scenarios as well as something of a feature to prevent some of your important characters from being lost too early on, and then you lose your edge in battle, making the game incompletable, perhaps. It's a little bit of a necessary video game side of things, and it prods at your suspension of disbelief where otherwise the story is so tight yet so impressively variable. So instead, injured units do have something more of a longer, second-hand effect on your story. See, when units are injured, they have less strength when going into battle next time. So, you either need to use other heroes, who are potentially not as able or as synergetic with your strategy, or you need to rest up in a camp for a few days so they can heal. But resting takes time, and time takes valuable supplies. So you have to balance the strength of your heroes against the state of your entire camp. As far as I'm concerned, it is a good solution, and it even links the consequences of the travelling mechanics closely with the combat mechanics. Your units are also going through their own story, and sometimes they will be needed elsewhere. It can be anything from your own choice to ask them to lead the charge on another front, their own personal journey temporarily taking them away from the party, or even your choices inadvertently causing their untimely death. Goodbye, Egil. You were too pure for this world. The point is, you have to keep yourself flexible to using a variety of different classes and combat styles. Not even your main character is safe for this for a few reasons, but a primary one is that there are multiple main characters, and you'll actually be shifting between different perspectives and different caravans across the three games. I wanted to first of all talk about the mechanical side of Banner Saga while letting you see the visuals and hear the music because as much as I'm going to speak about the setting, the story, and tonal side of things, not much really does something like this justice other than playing and seeing it yourself. But you've probably picked up on the fact that this is just... wow. The art and the music of Banner Saga is committed to making you feel invested in its melancholic, Norse-inspired world. Gorgeously presented vistas bring the land to life and even the background shots during battles show a world that's lived in. Sometimes majestic and worthy of awe, sometimes dirty, blood-soaked and cruel, but always consistent. Always true to the characters you take along with you. As the former beauty begins to be pulled apart with war and cataclysm as your story continues, you can relate to the people you're leading because the beauty that shines through so effortlessly in the artwork is also being ripped apart. The animations are all hand animated, and the small amount of cutscenes punctuate some of the more dramatic moments along the way. I'd kill for more of these cutscenes. Seeing these characters fully brought to life in such a talented way is really special. But maybe that says more about my investment with the characters than it does for the visual quality, as excellent as both of those things are. It's not just the visuals that pull you in. You're hearing songs from the soundtrack during this video, but within the game, different variations of the music play depending on where you are and what's happening. This is both technically impressive, as well as very fitting for a game with such a freedom to sculpt your own story. The composer, Grammy-nominated Austin Wintory, described the music as having a sort of gentle sadness, but through the lens of proud, mighty warriors. I tend to agree that most of the music does follow that philosophy, and there are high and low points in different tracks that lean further towards the sorrow, or towards the victory, the pride, or pomp. But there's another feeling that I think the music got across, and it's probably the most powerful feeling that got across to me personally, and that feeling is dread. I don't think I've played a video game that has had me feeling dread and tension quite like the Banner Saga. I know that sounds kind of bad, because 
You want to play multiple hours of something that makes you feel anxious. But hear me out. While there are multiple characters you'll be controlling, you probably spend the most time with Rook and his daughter Alette. I wouldn't necessarily say these two are the main characters. There are other groups that have a much more important impact on the state of the world and the overarching story. But Rook and Alette bring a certain amount of humanity and tie the story's themes together. They begin as simple but well-regarded hunters, but are very quickly thrust into a position of responsibility. You can feel their uncertainty, their unwillingness to kill, and their eagerness to avoid bloodshed whenever possible. But they are looked up to, and more so as the story goes along. You are in their shoes. And when something goes wrong, when people die, it's your fault, whether that's fair or not. Dwindling supplies, refugees who wish to join your camp, those who would want your position of leadership, and of course, the ever-present threat of the dredge. A seemingly warlike race that are always at the heels of your caravan. They're all ever-present threats. Through this constant adversity, you are put in a place where you carefully study each and every choice you make. Rook, Alette, and the friends and allies you make along the way make you care about the outcome on both a micro and macro level on each decision's consequence, as each consequence spills over to the next. The tension is often heavy, and it brings a seriousness to your choices, as well as a, a grip on the player. But it doesn't mean there's no place for levity, either. Rook and Ivor's friendship often brought a smile to my face, and I actually laughed out loud when I learned why Ollie can only fight while he's drunk. There's a lot of fantastic and charming little details to both the characters and the world too, that you might only pick up on if you're paying attention. I give the writers a lot of credit because there is very little explanation of what's happening early on. Characters seem to talk about events and lore that you haven't been given access to learn about yet. I even read one review that complained about this, saying they nearly gave up on the game early because he didn't understand what was happening. But I personally think that being thrown right in the deep end of a fully realized world actually works. It creates intrigue, it makes you hungry to learn more, and feels more like something that's fully realized. There is some great character growth throughout too. My boy Ludin has quite the arc from sniveling prince that really needs a slap in the face, to a total bro with wisdom and confidence beyond his years. There are many characters that feel morally ambiguous, right up until the end. They're written with understandable motives, but full of personal flaws or selfish means. You're left with a cast that the game tries its best to give enough screen time to. And while some are left with less than others, but in general I think having so many interesting stories of so many unique, investable personalities is commendable. You love to love them, or you love to hate them. The Banner Saga is a story that will be slightly different for you than it will be for me. My ending was bittersweet, it was sad but satisfying. It is a story of great struggles, and the people who live only to keep alive the few embers of hope they still believe in, despite overwhelming forces around them that wish to snuff it out. It is a story that is crafted by you, as the people of your caravan sew it into the banner they carry with them. I had to start a new game to get the footage for this video, but I was a little reluctant inside to do so. Not because it wasn't a great series, it really is. But the story had been told and it had stuck with me. I had made the outcomes what they were, and the art, the music, the story was so immersive that it felt a little perverse for me to go back and alter that. My banner was finished. And now I urge you, to go and start a banner of your own. Thank you for watching another Star Games. Please remember to subscribe, and there are links to the Twitch channel, the Twitter, and Discord, uh, where you can chat to me and others about whatever in the description. Thanks very much for watching, and I hope to see you again. Goodbye for now.